minister to us this morning on this subject, the pursuit. The pursuit, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 4. The scripture is referencing the age and the spirit of the last days in which you and I live. The Bible says that in the last days, and you can read verses 1, 2, 3, when we come to verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The pursuit. Everybody say the pursuit. Sister Donna, would you pray over the word? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. People have been given the instinct by God to have motivation and desire. A lot of people do not use the instinct that God has given them. They become lazy physically. They become lazy emotionally. And they also more importantly, become lazy spiritually. And I firmly believe that God wants us to use the instinct of motivation and desire in our life. But as we use motivation and desire that God has given to us, we need to use this motivation in the proper channels in the proper framework that God would have us to use these in. And in the day and in the age that we live in, one of the things that people pursue automatically is pleasure. Everybody say pleasure. And the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 4 that the time will come, and of course now is, that people will be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. To desire pleasure is not wrong because pleasure has been created by God and God has created pleasure for you and me to enjoy because there are times that we need to just sit back and relax. There are times that we need to regroup ourselves, and there are times and instances in pleasure that it will help us refocus and resharpen our mind and our spirit and our attitude. But even though pleasure is created by God for us to enjoy, people use the instinct of motivation and desire to pursue pleasure to the point of their detriment. And then they become, as the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 4, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. There are some that teach and preach that God wants us to live a life that is dull and boring. That's not true. God wants us to enjoy life. Look what God has done for us. He has given us color that we can enjoy. Now, everything would be dull and boring if everything was in black and white. But yet, God has given us color. We have the blue sky. We have the white clouds. We have the yellow sun. We have the bluish green gulf. We have the white sands. Amen. We have green grass. God has put within our lives things that we can enjoy. Times of laughter. Times of fun, times of fellowship one with another. And God wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to enjoy life. But the problem with pleasure is people pursue pleasure in the wrong ways and in the wrong attitudes. 
I want to ask you this morning as I preach on the pursuit, what are you pursuing? And when you are pursuing something, that means you're after it. You're hunting for it. You're, you're looking for it. You're longing for it. It's not just something that's on the side that if I get it, so be it. But when you pursue it, there is motivation, there is desire, and there is determination. What are you pursuing today? Are you pursuing God or are you pursuing pleasure? Are you pursuing God or are you pursuing pleasure? We say we want revival. We desire revival. We crave revival. We hunger for revival. But yet if you are actively pursuing revival, then you will be actively inviting people to church. You will be actively witnessing to someone. You will be actively praying for revival and fasting that God can use you. Some people say, I want more of God. I have a hunger to have a closer relationship with God. But are you pursuing God? That you are spending the time, you are spending the energy that I am dedicating myself to prayer. I am giving myself to prayer and worship. I am giving myself study to the word of God so I can intimately know more about him. Some say I want my church to be more on fire than ever before. But when it comes time to worship in church, there is no worship. There is no activity. People are just looking about, looking at what someone else is doing, look at what someone else is not doing. I wish they sing better. I wish they sing this. I wish they sing that. So what are we pursuing? Are we pursuing God? Are we pursuing the kingdom of God? Or are we pursuing pleasure? When we begin to pursue pleasure to the detriment of our soul and detriment of our life, we begin to take on the attitude, I want to go higher and faster and more exciting than I ever have before. An example of this, and there's nothing wrong with what I'm about to use as an example, but it's the only thing I can think of that came to my mind. In 1973 in Atlanta, Georgia at Six Flags over Georgia, They opened a wooden roller coaster that was called the, Ameri the Great American Stream Machine. When that roller coaster opened up in 1973, it was the tallest and it was the fastest wooden roller coaster in the world. It's 100 and feet, 105 feet tall at its peak and it drops straight down and it looks like you're going into a lake of water. And at its fastest, it clocks at 57 miles an hour. But today, 40 years later, that's not so tall, and that's not so fast for a roller coaster. But I remember as a teenager going to Six Flags over Georgia, and the line to get on, amen, the Great American Stream Machine was an hour, two hours, three hours long just to ride that minute and a half. That when you go down the embankment and you raise your hands and you scream, you're lifted out of your seat because of the force of gravity or the lack of gravity. But as things were, people began to become dull, if you will, toward the screen machine, and so they wanted something else. Five years later in 1978 at Six Flags Over Georgia, they installed and they opened up the first, the world's first triple loop roller coaster. That was a blast. You're riding down, you're going around, and you do the loop-de-loops. You're upside down for just a half a second, but it was neat. It was scary. It was new. It was thrilling. But yet today, it's nothing. You've got roller coasters where people, it looks like they're standing and they're going upside down and going fast. But that's because of pleasure. Pleasure wants you to go higher and faster and more exciting than ever before. 
Because when you seek after pleasure and you pursue pleasure, you never find the total completeness that you are looking for. A person that pursues pleasure from alcohol to get drunk to escape the things of the world finds himself needing an extra drink or finds himself needing a stronger drink to get that same drunk, to get that same high that he used to get when he first started drinking. A person that does drugs to try to escape the realities of the world finds that they need a stronger type of drug or more of the same drug and take it in a stronger amount to try to get the same high that they used to reach. And so it is with pleasure on and on and on to push and push and push, trying to get that same excitement out of pleasure that once you got out of pleasure, but it's no longer there until people finally begin to crack and they begin to break under the emotional strain. People pursue pleasure instead of God, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, even to their own detriment, even to their own hurt. But are we pursuing God or are we pursuing pleasure? It disturbs me. It disturbs me, especially the last several weeks and couple of months, our church attendance the way it's been. One week it's decent, another week it's, I'll just be honest with you, it's just terrible. And there's no reason for it. No reason for it. Amen. We want revival. We want to build a church, but when the saints of God are not here, amen, and we have more visitors than we have church members, what does God think about that? We set a time aside for prayer. People that are involved and in being used in the different departments, you need to be praying. You need to have be here early for prayer. My wife told me of a lesson that she taught in her Sunday school lesson a couple of weeks ago, something about disrespecting God. And it's amazing, and I've seen it over the years, that people will go to work with just a little bit of a headache but won't come to church with a little bit of a headache. Amen. Amen. You say, well, Brother Uspan, I've got to go to work. Amen. I've got to earn a living to pay my bills. Well, you need to come to church so you can be saved. Amen. I said you need to come to church so you can be saved. People will scream. People will holler. People will spend hundreds of dollars to go to a dumb football game. But yet when it comes to church, they come dragging in. They can't lift a hand. They can't be faithful with their tithe. They can't be faithful with their offering. And they wonder why there's no revival. They wonder why there's no anointing. Because the spirit of the day and the spirit of the ages, we are pursuing pleasure more than pursuing God. And what happens is people don't realize that as they pursue pleasure in the wrong ways and in the wrong attitudes, they pursue that pleasure to their own detriment and to their own hurt. We read of an individual that was foreordained by God before his birth to be used of God. Judges chapter 13 and verse number 5, the word of the Lord came and said, For thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite on the God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. He was ordained by God even before his birth. You say, well, Brother Uzipan, that was a special case. No, it's not. Every one of us that's in this building, we have been foreordained by God for a calling and for a purpose in his kingdom. We have been foreordained for a calling and for a purpose in this local church and in our community and in our town. And if we do not pursue after God, we are going to miss what God has called us to do. Yet we get so wrapped up pursuing pleasure. And pleasure is more than just the laughter. It is more than just the fun time. But it's basically doing just what we want to do. And if I don't feel like it, I'm not going to do it. The Bible tells us that he had a calling and he had an anointing. 
But one of the first two things that we read about this man is the pursuit of pleasure. Judges chapter 14, verse number 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. And he came up and told his mother and father and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. The desire was wrong. What's wrong with one of the ladies of Israel? What's wrong with one of the ladies of your tribe, amen, which God foreordained in his law that you should marry? You are not to marry the Gentiles. You are not to marry the heathen surrounding you was one of the commandments of God that God gave Israel before they came into the promised land. But he was a man that was ordained of God to be a judge. He was a man that was going to be a deliverer. He was a man that had a calling upon him that had supernatural ability and supernatural strength, but all he could see was a Philistine woman. As you read chapter 14 and chapter 15 of Judges, you see that he was used of God mightily. But as you read Judges chapter 16 and verse number 1, we read this. And Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in unto her. He saw a prostitute that was selling herself for a sexual pleasure for so many dollars. But instead of Samson keeping himself pure, amen, keeping himself holy, a man that was used of God wanted to fulfill a sexual pleasure just for a moment. I'm here to tell you, when we become lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, we are putting ourselves, maybe not physically as he did, in a place of spiritual detriment or physical detriment, but we are going to put Put ourselves in a place of spiritual detriment that we will begin to commit adultery and fornication with the gods of this world and the philosophies of this world and God will not be pleased. It was a man that had a calling, a man that had a purpose, but because of pleasure, he was going down the road that would lead to his hurt in his life. Because as you skip down to verse number 4 in Judges chapter 16, the Bible says, After this he loved a woman in the valley of Sordek whose name was Delilah, another Philistine. He couldn't keep his eyes in the church. He couldn't keep his heart right with God. Even though that God used him, even though he was a judge of Israel, even though he was anointed of God, there was something always with inside of him driving him and pointing him the wrong way instead of pointing him to the cross and pointing his eyes toward heaven. He was looking, always looking at the world. I'm asking you today, what are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? And I'm going to ask this church collectively as a body, what are we pursuing as a church family? What are we pursuing as a church family? When we pursue pleasure, I'm going to tell you, pleasure is not going to love you back. The harlot didn't love him back. The wife that he took from the sons of Timnath did not love him back, but yet she was stolen through trickery and bribery. Amen. And Delilah, most of all, did not love him back. The Bible says this in Proverbs 13 and 15, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. When you begin to follow pleasure and you begin to desire pleasure, that you put God aside, you put the things of God aside. Well, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe when our next revival comes around, then I'll get it all in order. I'll pray tomorrow. I'll read my Bible tomorrow. Oh, come on. Let's not have that spirit. I'm going to do it tomorrow. The Bible says now is the accepted time and now is the day of salvation. While we have the chance and while we have the opportunity, let let us pursue God. Let us desire God that he is going to be the number one thing in our life. He is going to be the apple of our eye. He is going to be our heartbeat. He is going to be our desire. You know, what's interesting about this word transgressor is not only sinner out on the street, following the way of the sinner out on the street is hard, but it's also talking about those that are backslid in church.
Those that are lukewarm in church, those that are cold in church, because we are transgressing the commandment, we are transgressing the law of God. And when we begin to pursue pleasure, and we begin to pursue our own wants, and begin to pursue our own desires, the way that we are going to follow, amen, it's going to be a hard way. We read in our scripture this morning, in our adult class, when we commit our way unto God and lean not to our own understanding, he is going to lead and direct our path. It's time that we pursue God. It's time that we rearrange things in our life that I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to hunger after God. I'm going to get everything back in perspective. Not tomorrow, not next week, but I'm going to begin to do it today because I want God's hand. I want God's blessing. I want God's favor. I want God's anointing on my life. Samson following pleasure could not see the detriment that he was in. And people, when they pursue pleasure, cannot see the detriment. They cannot see the damage that they are bringing upon themselves. As you read the narrative of the book of Judges, it's just amazing how dumb can Samson be. 16 and 6 And Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray you, wherein your great strength lies and with what you might be bound to subdue you. Man, that that, that should have sent warning bells right there. Tell me, what makes you like any other man so you might be subdued? That should have been a warning bell. Keep away. That's fire. You're going to get burnt. But Samson was so in love with pleasure, that he began to play with fire. And you know the old saying, you play with fire, you're going to get burnt. Well, I'm a big boy. I won't get burnt. How many of us big boys ever got burnt before? In more ways than one. Amen. You may not get burnt the first time, You may not get burnt a second time, but when you do something repetitively over and over again, what happens? We become careless. We take it for granted. I've got it under control. We take it for granted. I can handle it. And then that's when we slip, and that's when we fall. So tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Verse number 10. Delilah came back to Samson and said unto Samson, You've mocked me, you made fun of me, and you told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Oh, come on, Samson, wake up! Can't you see the danger? Can't you see the situation that you're in? Amen. She wasn't sly like the devil was. When the devil came to Eve and said, if you eat of that fruit, you shall be as God. You shall know good and evil. Amen. No, no, no. He, she, he was, she wasn't sly like Satan. She just came out and said, man, you've lied to me. Now tell me what's going to take to make you like any other man. What's going to bind you? What he should have done right there and then with his big strength, got his hulking body out of there and ran for his life. But he was too dumb to do it. Our next verse. The Bible says, and it came to pass, the Bible says, when she pressed him daily with her words. What does that mean? Every day. Tell me where your strength lies. Tell me where your strength lies. Tell me where your strength lies. Every day, every day, every day, every day. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And urged him so that his soul was vexed on to death. You know what this means? He was at the point when it talks about being vexed that you're almost to the point of crying because of the pressure. You're just so overwhelmed with emotion that you're just about to break down. I can't take it anymore! You know, Solomon said, it's better to dwell on the rooftop than dwell in the house with a cantankerous wife. Well, Solomon should have realized, here's someone that's being awful cantankerous. I better get out of here. But no, he didn't. He didn't. 
but he was at the point that he couldn't take it anymore. He should have said, enough is enough. I'm out of here. But he was blinded by pleasure. He was blinded by pleasure. And so he was in emotional pain. He was in emotional misery to the point of dying. But because of the false pursuit of pleasure, Samson could not see what was going on. And you know the rest of the story. Judges chapter 16, verse 19, and she made him sleep upon her knees. When you pursue pleasure, you begin to go to sleep spiritually. And you fall asleep on the knees of a prostitute. You fall, your, you fall asleep on the knees of your enemy. You fall asleep on the one that wants to hurt you and destroy you. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him. Not the Philistines, but she afflicted him. Oh, I thought you loved me. The thing, listen to me, the things of the world do not love you. Pleasure does not love you. It wants to become your master. It wants to bind you. It wants to send your soul to hell. It wants to commit torture in your life where you're miserable that you'll turn your back upon God. But say amen. You think the devil cares a flip about you? He doesn't care a flip about you. He wants you to die and go to hell. Why? Because you're the creation of God. He wants to destroy every aspect of the creation of God. But let us pursue God that we stand firm and we say, hey, there is no way that I'm going down, but I'm going to go up. I'm going to rise and meet the Lord in the air. I'm going to serve my Jesus. I'm going to magnify my Jesus. I'm going to let the power of God and the anointing of God to be upon me. And as she began to afflict him, the Bible says his strength went from him. And she said, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And because he was asleep spiritually, look what he said. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he did not know that the Lord was departed from him. I'm gonna, I did it before. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to go to church today, and I'm going to feel the touch of God, and I'm going to shout today one more time, and then I'll make that pledge. I'll make that vow one more time. But when you fall asleep on the knees of pleasure, and you begin to pursue pleasure to the detriment of your soul. There you are putting yourself in a place that there may come a time that God is not there anymore. Because he said, you love pleasure more than you love me. Now let's see pleasure strengthen you. Let's see pleasure help you. Let's see pleasure carry you through. And he did not know that the Spirit of the Lord was departed from him, all because of pleasure. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3 says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, and deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is what living in pleasure does. You're deceiving your own self. You're walking down the wrong path. You're, you're acting as a foolish person, disobedient to the word of God. And when someone is living in pleasure and you see someone that's enjoying pleasure more than you, a spirit of envy rise up with inside of you that I'm going to get what they've got. I'm going to do one better because I want to go higher. I want to go faster. I want to go longer than the person next to me. The pursuit. What are you pursuing today? Are you giving your energies? Are you giving your time? Are you giving your strength to fulfill flesh, to fulfill pleasures of flesh? Or are you giving your energies, giving your time to pursue God? The pursuit of worldly pleasure will deceive you. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 22, the Bible says, He also received seed among the thorns, 
is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 14, Luke says this about the same parable. And when they fell among thorns, are they which when they have heard and go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. One of the reasons people do not live a joyful and victorious life one of the reasons people face the spirit, the amounting, amen, amounting spirit of depression with inside of them, they cannot get over the next hill because they're seeking after pleasure. They're following after the deceitfulness of pleasure, the deceitfulness of riches that choke the world and the things of the world, amen, and it chokes the word of God, and they become unfruitful. They begin to bring a bud forth. They begin to bring some fruit forth, but because they are not pursuing God, the weed set in and the thing set in that begins to choke out the word. And it causes them to be unfruitful. The deceitfulness of pleasure, the deceitfulness of riches. They try to promise peace and pleasure, but they can never give you true peace and they can never give you true pleasure. And some people allow the pursuit of pleasure to take them to the point that the only thing they can eat is pig's food. I'm going to say that again. Some people allow the pursuit of pleasure to take them to the point that the only thing they could eat if they could get their hand upon it is food for pigs. Luke chapter 15, verse number 13, And not many days after, the younger son gathered together took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. What's that, pleasure? And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want and went and joined himself to a citizen in that country and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. You think the world cares about you today? You, do you think the world really cares about you today? Go ahead and backslide. Go ahead and get cold and see if the world puts its gratitude and, and, and all that kind of good stuff in your life and on your life. Go ahead. You'll end up in the pig's pen. You'll be hungry spiritually as this young man was physically, and he would eat, amen, the husk that were given to the swine, but he could not even have that. That's where the pursuit of pleasure will drive you to. Oh, it may not drive you to that point physically, but it will drive you to that point spiritually, that with inside of you, that longing and that craving, God cannot be filled. There was a lady that I had the pleasure of meeting several years ago, her husband was a big shot. I mean big, big shot. He was the head of the local hospital in Statesboro, Georgia. He was moved in. And his wife, Pamela, came to our church. Pamela was the daughter of an apostolic preacher. But Pamela backslid, and she pursued pleasure. Pamela had money. I don't know who the richest person in our church is, don't care to know, but I guarantee you Pamela had more money than you got. They were wealthy to the extreme. Drove a brand new BMW, wore the finest of clothes, but yet she blew her mind on drugs, drew her, blew her mind on alcohol. Her mom and dad, who used to pastor in southern Louisiana, would come over and visit every once in a while, and we would talk, and he would tell me, Brother Yuspan, and I want to see Pamela get right with God. Five, six years later, Pamela committed suicide because she found out Pleasure 
did not satisfy her soul. But she was so blinded by pleasure, she would never make her way to an altar and repent. She would never surrender her life. My wife would talk to her constantly. Get right with God. Quit playing around with God. I would preach my heart out. Oh, she'd come to church. She'd clap her hands. She'd raise her hands. And there were times that she would bless the church financially. But yet, at the end, when she committed suicide, she stepped out into eternity, lost without God. Because of pleasure, she could not see the danger that she brought upon herself. Are you going to allow pleasure to draw you to the bottom? Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10, I've preached from this scripture a couple of times since I've been here. Paul says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Here is the eternal testimony of a man that walked with Paul. Here is the eternal testimony that is eternally written in Scripture for you and I to read. He loved this present world. He was not willing anymore to face the hardships. He was not willing to face the struggles. But the present world with its shapes and its solicitations became so important to him that Demas left Paul. The things that are seen, the things that are temporal, the things that are subtle, that, that appeal to our weakest side and the weakest point of our nature whether it's wealth, whether it's earthly loves, whether it's material advantages, or whether it's just worldly ease or comfort or safety. This affected this man. And he turned it all away to go back home to Thessalonica. He loved this present world. Demas, if you could know or if you knew now what you should have known then, would you have left Paul? To have it recorded in Holy Scripture. He left me. Did he ever get himself back where he needed to be? Don't know. Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say. But he loved the world. He was pursuing pleasure. The pursuit drove him. Paul, I love you, but I can't take this anymore. There's other things that I want to do. There's other goals. There's other dreams. There's other aspirations I want to achieve in my life. I don't want to spend the last years of my life in a prison cell because of the Word of God. I don't want to have to face times of starving, face times of nakedness, face times of peril like you have for the cause of Jesus Christ. I'm going back home to Thessalonica, and I'm going to get my lazy boy, and I'm going to be lazy. The eternal testimony of a man. When this thing all wraps up, what will your eternal testimony be? Be. Are you pursuing pleasure or are you pursuing God? Here's something you need to remember when you begin to pursue God, it's because God has put the urge within you. Jesus said, No man can come unto me in the book of John except the Father draw him unto me. But we can get to the point and we can get to the place that we will drown out that urging. We will drown out that calling. We, we will drown out that spirit with inside of us to draw ourselves to God. Are you pursuing God or are you pursuing pleasure? It's one thing to say, I want God. It's one thing to say, I want to be used of God. It's one thing to say, I want God's blessing. I want God's anointing. I want God's revival. It's one thing to say, I want to draw closer to him. 
But unless you begin to pursue him, you'll never achieve that goal. You will never achieve that goal. Brother Riley, as he spoke Wednesday night, and I wish I could think exactly how he said it, but said something like this. Am I doing all that I can? You know, we can ask ourselves the question, am I doing all that I can for God? Am I really giving myself to God as a living sacrifice? Am I being good, productive ground for God? Oh, I want to do more for Jesus. I want to become productive ground for Jesus. I want to be good ground for Jesus. But it takes something to do it. We've got to pursue God. We can't pursue pleasure. We can't pursue the things of this world. Because if we do, we will never achieve what God wants us to achieve. Everybody say amen. So God puts that calling in our life. God puts that drawing within our life. God puts that craving within our life. And anything that prevents that drawing that God puts within our life that causes us to keep from coming to him is something else that's drawing us away from God. And it's the pursuit of pleasure. I want to do, I want to do, I want to do, I want to go. You say, Brother Yuspan, you said God wants us to enjoy pleasure. Yes, he does. And you said that pleasure comes from God. Yes, it does. But the pleasure that God has truly, uh, uh, truly wants us to enjoy comes from him. Psalm 16 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. When we begin to learn that the pleasures that God has given to us, we will keep them in the right perspective. We will keep them in the right order. And we will not allow them to drive us and motivate us, amen, to the neglect of allowing the pursuit of God to be placed upon the sidelines. I've heard it said, if I can use this analogy, and I've read it, I've never heard it personally, but I've heard other people say it, I've read it several times, that people in the business world, as they come to the close of their life, they never say, I wish I'd have spent more time in the office, but it's huge that I wish I'd have spent more time with my family. So when it comes to the close of our life, whenever that may be, whether the trumpet sounds or they place this body in the grave, will we say, well, I wish I spent more time with God? Or I wish I would have spent more time chasing the things of this world? The pursuit. What's motivating you? What's driving you? What's motivating you? What's driving you? What's pushing you? Is it the pursuit of God? Is it the things of God? Is there that hunger and that desire that you're crying out to Him? Will you pursue God and allow Him to fill your soul with what pleasure really is? 1 Peter 1 and 8, the Bible says, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If I never have the fanciest automobile, if I never wear the finest of clothes, and if I never live in the fanciest home on the block, that's cool with me, as long as I can enjoy his presence. As long as I can say, I believe in him, hallelujah, and I rejoice, I rejoice, I rejoice, I rejoice, because I want to pursue my God. I want to love my God. I want to stay in his presence. I hunger for him, and I long for him. 
The Bible says, but rejoice in 1 Peter 4, 13, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding great joy. Exceeding joy. I'm going to love him. I'm going to long for him. I'm going to search for him because I want my Jesus. 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 Is there anyone that says I want my Jesus? That I long for him. I desire for him. I crave after him. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after the oh God Psalms 42 I desire him I want to pursue my God I want to pursue my Jesus because he is more important to me than anything that this world can give he should be more important to you than anything that this world can give. There should be a craving and a longing, hallelujah, that God, I want you. Oh, God, I want you. Oh, God, I'm willing to give. I'm willing to surrender. I'm willing to yield myself to you because I want to pursue you, Lord. In the last days, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And one of the things about being a lover of pleasure and understand what I'm about to say does not make you a mean, evil, and terrible person because you can still love pleasure and give the shirt off your back to someone else. But when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to Jesus, I want to pursue after him. I want to walk in his presence. I want to walk in his presence. I want to feel the Shekinah glory around me. Hallelujah. I want to be strengthened with inside of him. I want my pleasure to be derived from my God. Hallelujah. I want to have the heartbeat. I want to breathe. I want to talk. I want to sing. I want to live for Jesus. What are you pursuing after? Let's stand. Let's love the Lord right now. Search me, Lord. These altars are open. If you'd like to come pray, let's give our life to God.